Here I got my November 6341, and he's about to get one socked to him by the, the thunderstorm, right? That was, a, that was a picture from the advisory circular 006 Alpha, the one that they made in 74 and then updated in 2016. That was uh, one, of my, one of my favorite pictures from back then. Anyhow, thunderstorm ingredients, and you're welcome. There they are. Easy. Pilots love to memorize stuff. Memorize that. Because that is exactly what you need to know for a thunderstorm. Every thunderstorm will have that. Anyone at all ever looked at a convective outlook? Or heard of a convective outlook? Or heard that there was a convective segment that could occur, but it wasn't formed yet, right? All the weather forecasters are telling you is that all these conditions exist, just nothing has begun a yep. real storm yet. It's there, but it hasn't turned into my guy yet. Yeah, he pulled up his right hand and decided to sock us one, okay? Lifting source, what does that mean? We've talked about it and I talked about it with great pain and agony in the beginning. What is this lifting for? Lifting source. I'm convinced they don't like me. It's, I just know it. Lifting source. What does that mean? What's being lifted? Is this a lifting source? Am I lifting this? You guys can't answer though because you know the answer. I know you do. Thank you for not answering. Because it would be no fun. If the four of you were only answering, it would be no fun. You know what this is. Somebody in here knows what this is. Oh, you put it about? Go ahead. Uh, we just need I the victim. Think, think, uh, victim number one. So lifting force, it, it kind of helps the, the thunderstorm to, uh, to form, to tower and cumulus. It's like a boost to kind of start the process of... Yeah, but the question is, what is... Right. Is so... Rising there. Oh, okay. All right. We're, we're getting there. I 100% I love what you guys did. And that was, you participated. <laughs> but what that does is that allows me a little feedback. So what I can do is try to help you, right? Because what you've done is you've told me it's uh, the lifting source is something that's lifting and making the thunderstorm. Look, you guys can pick on me all you want to, and I love it. I laugh at myself all the time. He'll tell you for sure. I know he'll tell you. I don't mind at all. But here's the thing. What if I, what if I said, uh, I'm going to define what this remote control is. This remote control is remote control. You're like, well, yeah, you just defined it by telling me what it is. <laughs> it doesn't help. Okay, think about what you said. That's good. I like what you're saying. But what caused that? Exactly what Andre said. What caused that? You told me it's lifting air. Okay. Well, help me. Why, why it's what is the source? A lifting source. That's why these words are so important. This little bit is the difference, and you understanding and comprehending this, the material, and you memorizing what you need to do to get through Nielsen so you get a certificate and move to the next one. I know how the game's played. It's not a surprise to me. I know this stuff, okay? It's okay. But what I do is I take a whole lot of interest and pride in helping you guys develop the next level, okay? Somebody had to do this to me, too. Somebody had to do this to everybody. It's okay. Think about lifting source. Now I'm getting you outside of your comfort zone. What in the world is lift? We can memorize these things, no problem. Tomorrow I'll ask you guys this. You know what? You tell me those three things. But lifting force, what in the world is it? I have no idea. I just remember you said that was important. What happened to the air that I was showing you guys in the unstable slides? What was happening with that air? What caused that air to move and develop into, what's that? That is some, but the slide on here, right? I know, because everybody was texting and passing love notes, right? But that lifting source was a terrain feature. It could be a terrain feature, 
right? It could be an air mass moving over some sort of terrain, and then that terrain causes it to move upward. Now, as it moves upward, it continues to weigh less than the surrounding air, and then move up and up and up. Okay, unstable conditions, that's the second one. It all fits together, and it's great. Essentially, I've already told you guys and already taught you guys all of these three things. Every single one of these things we went over in subsequent in previous slides to great pain <laughs> for me. But lifting force, lifting source is just some way to begin that moving of the air. Some way. And it, it doesn't have to be specific. Heating from below, that's an example of a lifting source. But it's something that causes air to initiate movement upwards. Okay? Great. So once it starts upward now, number two unstable conditions. It starts moving upwards and continues moving upwards. Okay? Fantastic. One more thing and bingo bango, we've got a thunderstorm. High humidity. None of this makes any difference at all. We had Noah doesn't care, right? All day today we've had lifting source and unstable conditions. I know because at 4.30 this morning I was out flying in it. And it was no big deal. It wasn't that bad. Nothing really became a, an issue for us. And if you looked, I, I didn't look all day long, but I seriously doubt any convective outlooks were published today. Reason being, that third condition never existed, so it wasn't a problem. On days when we do have very high humidity, now all of that unstable condition that <coughs> continues to rise develops into something. It develops into this. You got your cumulus stage and you can go through your freezing level and you go through the different uh, pressure levels and so forth. But you got the equilibrium level somewhere vicinity where? Where's 35,000 feet? We went over that one too. Not too long ago. Where's that equilibrium level? Where does most of our weather exist in our atmosphere? We had a bunch of different layers, didn't we? I think it was like slide two, three. Perfect. So that equilibrium level, this is my tropopause. Things are going to begin to settle down here. Well, something very interesting happens there, okay? And we'll look at the next slide and see. I'm excited. I love this part. This part's always fun for me. All right. So I got a cumulus stage right there. I have all three, four, all three of those ingredients that I need, everything that I need to create a storm, and it begins. Once it begins, it forms rapidly. I think we'll all agree we've seen these things that are flown somewhere more than 20 miles away from one. Okay, that is important, more than 20 miles away from one, and never any closer than 20 miles to one. But once it begins to form, it begins to form and continues to form and move upwards. That's the mature stage. And the mature stage is indicated by this. This is when rain falls to the surface. When rain falls from a cloud and it does not reach the surface, it's called virga. But when it falls and reaches all the way to the surface... I now have a mature stage of the thunderstorm, five to 10 miles high. Inside this storm is relentless. The winds are unpredictable. The hazards are nearly indescribable. Look, we are over, we are higher than the freezing level. That implies to me that although there is a great deal of energy here, I probably have some sort of mixture of icing conditions. I have a, a tragedy waiting for me inside of this thing, okay? Now, once the mature stage, which is the most dangerous stage of the thunderstorm, once that mature stage cycles to a dissipating stage, the updrafts have subsided. They have not completely disappeared, but they have subsided. It's characterized primarily of downdrafts. 
We've got rain just falling out of this cloud. And you can see, I've tried over the last many years to take a nice picture because I, I, I see the dissipating clouds. And for certain reasons, on different operations, I may, I may want to find that dissipating stage. But I've seen these things and I've taken pictures of them and, and it always either shows my hand in this glare shield or something has destroyed the picture. But you can see the storm just caving in on itself. It's like it's just imploding. When, when seen and witnessed from above, these things are pretty neat looking, okay? And it's mostly downdrafts. All right, fine, fantastic. Now, equilibrium level. I'm gonna tell you guys that that tropopause contains a unique uh, phenomena. It contains the jet stream. And the jet stream has very, very fast moving air in excess of 100 knots. If the cloud, if the thunderstorm continues to develop into the tropopause, then it will develop and form an anvil. This storm, very powerful. I know it's moving in this direction because that's the direction that the upper level winds are moving. And it may contain or uh, it may spit out hail, right? It may exhaust some hail on me. This is one of the outputs of this storm. Everything up here is absolutely 100% frozen. This is primarily why we remain more than 20 nautical miles away. You heard the 20 nautical mile rule from a thunderstorm, right? God bless him. Uh, there was one student that we had that heard, I think, uh, every uh, 25th word that I said. I don't know if I talked that fast or whatever. I'm sorry. But when he went to his exam, and he went to an exam probably just a little bit too early, whatever, the examiner said, how far should I stay away from a thunderstorm? And he said, I should stay exactly two miles away from a thunderstorm. I don't know if you got two mixed up with 20 or where that occurred something. People get nervous sometimes. And I was like, two? Are you kidding me, man? Why, have you seen these storms around here? Whatever. So 20. Everybody knows 20 now. And you can't say that you don't. I get it on tape. All right. This is why. Think about how far 20 miles is away from here. That's, all, that's Dade County. That's almost, that's North Miami. That is a long drive from here, okay? Hail can be generated by this storm and fall within 20 nautical miles of it. Hail is an accumulation, like I said earlier, of ice pellets. When ice pellets gather together, they form hail. This, when it comes in contact with an airplane, will likely damage the airplane, okay? It just so happened that one of the ground classes that I was teaching, we came in and it was a weekend class, so Friday we had already done everything. I told, I told them, hey, bring your coffee tomorrow because Saturday morning we're going to start off with weather and it's great. You guys can see how the start of weather goes. They're like, yeah, I'm kind of halfway behind this guy. I don't think he knows what he's talking about, though. Or I understand. It's not my first time either. This happened on a Friday night, and my student brought it in and said, I want to share a picture with you. This happened not here. I don't know where it was. It happened with the guy who told about two miles? Probably the same guy. But you can see the airplane is essentially destroyed. Okay, There's a lot of work that's going to go into this airplane. Imagine this coming down on 737 Yankee Alpha or whatever one we got now. I don't even know all the call signs. 4-1 Mike Echo, it gets a face full of that. Okay? It, it, it should be fine. fine. <laughs> we should be okay. We're going to read about you in the newspaper, and we'll all pour out some liquor for you that night. Okay? <laughs> all right, anyways, let's go and talk about and review, please, if you would. Help me. And it's okay. If everybody says it together at the same time, then we don't hear you saying it by yourself. What stage is this storm? Hint, it's the first one. Cumulus stage. Cumulus stage, okay. What stage is this storm? And why? Someone's got to tell me why. Perfect. 
I have rain on the ground. It's the mature stage, okay? This is a picture that I took. It wasn't the best. The best one that I took, like, uh, the just flash flashed on it or did it wasn't nice. But this is my dissipating stage storm, right? And underneath, I can't remember, I think I was at 12,000, 14,000 or whatever. But underneath of that was just a, a, just a torrential downpour. It's a dissipating stage. Above it, you could just see it. And, and a video would have done this more justice because you could just see that, that storm just caving in on itself. It looked pretty neat. Okay, there's a special uh, word for a long line of severe thunderstorms. Squall. There it is. Squall line. Where should I be if I'm anywhere near a squall line? Well, I should be outside my station wagon, as you can see down here, taking a picture from the ground. <laughs> so certainly I don't want to be involved in this storm. I have seen on more than one instance a squall line extending acro laterally across the peninsula of Florida. Oh, a good quarter of the way to the Yucatan Peninsula and way out into the Caribbean Sea, okay? In other words, we weren't doing a lot of flying that day, okay? So there's your squall line. This is an example of, it says rain shaft, I get it, it's the rain shaft, but it's an example or my example uh, of the microburst. Now, a microburst, these things are supposed to be uh, undetectable. There are ground detection systems. There was a, a flight, I can't remember which flight, whatever what it was. It was a big airliner, and it was in Texas. That's about all I know about this thing. They encountered one before the ground proximity uh, alerts of these, and an airliner, I think it had four, and I think it was a 747. Anybody know? I think it was a 747. It, it was an airliner. Let's just say this thing had enough power. Uh, to climb very fast with a lot of people on it, crashed because of a microburst encounter, okay? Can't see it. You have no idea that it's there. It exists, in this case, as a rain shaft coming straight down and then moving in all directions. R remove that word rain shaft and just think about an air shaft. It's just coming down as air. I won't see this thing. It could be a mile and a half in diameter. The Downdraft could exceed 6,000 feet per minute. How fast does 08 Juliet climb? Anywhere near 6,000 feet per minute? So we're not going to climb up it, okay? And hopefully we make it past it in less than uh, one minute and we're above 6,000 feet before we get in it, okay? So well, that's your microburst encounter. Different places have different... Uh, uh, different operators and different airplanes have different escape procedures. A common escape procedure is 20 degrees pitch up, full power, max mechanical, whatever you have, push it in there. And then depending on your landing gear, if your landing gear opens before it folds the rest of the, the wheels in, then you leave the landing gear down. You don't even retract the landing gear. But if you don't have landing gear that opens first, you guys have all seen this before, where the landing gear will open, some of the doors will open, and then the gear comes up, and then the door closes again. If you don't have that type of landing gear, you could raise your landing gear. But they say no changes in configuration, 20 degrees pitch up, and max mechanical. That's what you do. Okay? It's a common technique anyways. Okay. Lightning will always have one phenomena, and that one phenomena is not hazardous to flight crews. Any guesses? Nope. If every thunderstorm had a microburst, we'd be in trouble. All thunderstorms have this one characteristic, this one trait, and it is not hazardous to flight crews. Perfect. Both of you are correct. That comes first and then that comes. And then why is thunder? Hmm. Well, let's not because it's the superheating of those uh, air molecules, but whatever. This, this is guaranteed. If you have a thunderstorm, you have maybe not that much, right? 
I like to grab the attention. But anyways, if you have a thunderstorm, you will have lightning. Without lightning, guess what you do not have? You don't have a thunderstorm. So if you have a, a, I don't know, a storm scope and you don't have any lightning, well, there's no storm, there's no lightning, there's no thunderstorm. It could be, it could be some uh, disruptive turbulence. It could be uh, uh, some upsetting ad attitudes. It could be upsetting um, turbulence, right? Unstable conditions, that's fine, but you don't have a thunderstorm without lightning. If, and, and by the way, every, every airplane flight manual that I've read has had some sort of some sort of instructions for if you inadvertently encounter severe turbulence. Because I could inadvertently encounter severe turbulence by no mistake on my own. I could encounter clear air turbulence. I could encounter a microburst. I could encounter any number of things and I did not mean to get in. That doesn't mean that I'm not uh, a prudent, uh, use good judgment uh, aviator. That just means that maybe I was just somewhere and, and I got stuck in this severe turbulence, okay? So don't think that we're saying or anyone's implying that you're gonna hunt for uh, the bad turbulence and try to get in there and see how bad it is. That's foolish. That's taking chances. That's macho. That's a hazardous attitude. Don't do it or invulnerability either way. But if you inadvertently encounter this stuff, most airplane flight manuals will tell you some sort of an escape tra some sort of an escape procedure. Most of them look very similar to this, minus the picture. You know, we hope that doesn't happen. But again, like I said, all for effect. <laughs> Maintain level flight attitude. Now, you want to fly below maneuvering speed. But you're not trying to maintain an airspeed. You're not trying to maintain an altitude. You're not trying to maintain a heading. You're not trying to do anything other than keep the greasy side down or closely thereabout down, right? And if you go through this thing and you're already in it, don't try to turn around. You're probably already through the worst part of it. Right? Continue on. Whatever your airplane flying manual states, that's exactly what you do. Each one is a little different, but what I'm giving you now are just rough guidelines for every one that I've read. Now, I've read a good bit of them. Okay? All right. Man made hazardous weather. Because this whole section was hazardous weather. Hey, look at here. It comes back to this. Okay, you guys know I love review session. You know I love check on learning. W what's going on here? Wait, Perfect, okay. Why does that exist? I always have to ask why. Look, your examiner's gonna ask why and if, if the examiner doesn't, mother nature will. So I may as well beat everybody to it and ask you why now. So why does that exist? Because it's producing lift and the winds spills vortices. Okay. All right. Is there any type of drag that might be associated with this? Yeah, induced, drag. induced drag. Okay. All right. Just kind of quick fire match you, check on learning. So I got rotation here. This is my rotation. Uh, as in the point where I'll initially begin to rotate the airplane about its lateral axis to increase the attitude and gain a flight condition. Take off. Okay. This is rotation. Well, the wake begins here. The wake condition is most hazardous or most violent from an airplane when it is heavy, clean, and slow. Okay, when it's those three things, heavy, clean, and slow, that's when it's the most. Uh, so I see wake. It's already happening. That's fine. You see that it's falling down. Well, I, I don't like what the FAA did here because yes, this does fall down and it moves in the direction of the surrounding wind. So if the wind patterns are that the wind is moving from the north, that's fine. These are gonna move from the north with it, right? These are gonna move just like the wind. But this one definitely moving down. Okay, touchdown, wake ends. So let's just walk through a scenario just real quick, please. 
I'm going to take off in uh, uh, 737, and I want to rotate where? Somewhere before this airplane did, correct? Yeah. Is that likely? Should I rotate probably before this Falcon 900 did? Yeah, that makes sense. They're going to use 4,000 feet to rotate. I'm going to use 600. Okay, great. Once I rotate, what is the very next thing on my mind? Avoid this flight path. Avoid the flight path. I like that. Okay. Talk to me a little more. I like this. Somebody else talk to me too. You're doing good. This is great. And turn up when... Perfect. We just now talked and we said those wingtip vortices are going to move in the direction of the wind. There's not a chance in the world. Anybody in here think that maybe for a second you might climb faster than a Falcon 900? We know that's ridiculous, right? There's not a chance of that happening. So don't think that because you took off before them that you're not eventually going to come across that flight path. I love what you said. You said, I'm going to avoid the flight path. Let's think about it, though. Unless we put propulsion boosters on this thing, I'm not going to get over it. So turn up wind, okay? This one here, the wake begins, that's fine. Where do I touch down? Beyond the touchdown. Beyond the touchdown, great. I've got a, uh, a professional pilot probably here. Where did they touch down? 1,000 foot mark. Okay, let's talk. What is that? Could I say they touched down somewhere else that describes it? First third of the runway. Could I say they touched down in the touchdown zone? Yeah. Okay, that's probably where they touched down. I like what you said. You described a part of the touchdown zone. That's fine. What he's saying is they touched down in the touchdown zone. You go in today to make your short field landing, or you always like to land and get off on hotel. Is that going to happen today? No. Hotel is right there in the touchdown zone, right? So it may be a little bit different than what you're used to doing. Now, you go to Pompano, you land behind a Falcon 50 over there on runway 15. They're hitting the threshold, too. They're hitting the number. So there's almost nowhere that you're going to get out of that touchdown zone. Know that as well. Okay, I want to land here somewhere after that touchdown zone. And then once I land on a touchdown zone, oh good, everything should be fine and dandy. Unless there is one type of wind condition that could cause a problem for me. That was the, you guys must, <laughs> you guys love me now, I'm convinced. That was great. The quartering tailwind. Because the light quartering tailwind, it says light quartering tailwind, we're not going to land upwind, but do you think they're going to change the direction that Fort Lauderdale International is landing just because of a five knot tailwind component? <sighs> they got 7,000, 8,000 feet runway over there. It's not a chance in the world. They're changing this entire system for just that. So light quartering tailwind, it's going to move not only that upwind vortice over the runway, but also in the direction that, I'm, that I should be landing. Okay, So just a consideration there. Wake turbulence, anybody know uh, how hazardous these things are? Are these things very serious or, or should I be okay? How many times do we hear... Uh, ATC telling us caution wake turbulence. All right, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna caution you. All right? How many times do we hear this? Anybody ever say unable landing? I want to go around. I want to try something else. Now, sometimes they'll say unable touch and go. You're gonna make a full stop. Right? I've heard them say that. They'll they'll restrict us for our operations. We're depending. But how hazardous is, is this stuff? Any any kind of accidents ever occurred because of wake turbulence involving airplanes? Yeah. yeah? Was it, was it air, uh, was it American or Southwest that broke the tail off the airplane? You guys remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Broke the tail off the airplane of 747, I think, on a parallel runway, right? Yeah. Am I right? So took off three, four minutes before the other airplane. And we're talking about a transport category airplane came in contact three minutes in trail with the wake turbulence and maybe something to do with training and, and rudder extension caused that airplane to break apart and crash. 
okay? So it's not to be taken lightly at all. And if you, for whatever reason, find yourself in the vicinity of a 757, these are some of the most treacherous with uh, wake turbulence. Now, I don't know what Boeing did when they made that thing. They put little wizard zombie uh, wake turbulence generators out there on the wingtips instead of winglets. But they're, it's a pretty bad machine. Okay. Lenticular clouds. Almond or lens shaped. Anywhere in where contact lenses? Never mind, because you're not going to tell if you do. I get it. All right, that's fine. But it looks like a contact lens, okay? And if you've never seen a contact lens or watched somebody put it in or done it yourself, then it looks like an almond. Okay. This is what it looks like. This is when winds 40 knots or greater blow across a mountain ridge. And they'll form some sort of... Uh, uh, cloud formation like this. I think, I don't know, but I think, is that Mount Fiji? Is that what that is? Someone told me that one time. I just put the picture on there because I liked it. Is it looking like a car? I've never seen it, so I don't know. I've seen the Golden Gate Bridge, the one I had up there earlier, and I asked you guys. I've seen that. But uh, underneath this cloud are violent winds, okay? Like the structural damage type winds. All right, does anybody have any questions?